All right, JT, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you very much, Randy. Good to see you. You too, man. So I see this quote on my Instagram a lot lately. I don't know what it is. It must be something to do with my feed, but it says something about like 8,000 to 10,000 baby boomers are retiring every day. And then a certain percentage of those people are selling a business and you're in the business of brokering those type of transactions, correct? Yep, that's correct. Do you feel like that's true? Are there are a lot of people that are getting out of their business that they've had for a long time and that's keeping you busy on your side of things? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's probably one of the, the biggest drivers for the lower middle market M&A stuff that we're doing is folks that are just 30 years into their business, ready to retire. And in the markets that we're focused on, they just don't seem to have a second or third generation to pass it on to. Uh, didn't really train up their staff to, to hand mm -hmm. it off. And so a lot of them are exiting and that's really their retirement wealth that they've built up over time. So yeah. that's a, a big driver right now. I thought it was an interesting thing. I, I don't know if my phone was like listening to our previous conversation or something and it starts feeding me this stuff. And I'm like, it's just an interesting thing to see knowing that we were going to be talking today. So Let me give you the background on, on Towns Associates real quick. It was started by my dad. So we're business partners and I officially joined him this year, 2024. Mm -hmm. But it goes all the way back to the mid nineties. He, he partnered with one of his college buddies out of Orono yeah. and his buddy had a, a brokerage firm at the time and they joined together and started leaders LLC in Portland, Maine, doing M and A and business brokering work. They mm -hmm. brought in two new partners and they ran that M and A practice for about 10 years out of the Portland office. And they had especially focus on like industrial gas market and manufacturing and mm -hmm. Around 2008, they actually started up their own private equity fund, which is kind of common for some M&A work. You, you start seeing all these deals and you're like, geez, maybe we should own some of these businesses. That's interesting. So they started a private equity fund and his business partner is Peter Anania, very successful business person in Southern Maine. Yep. And the Anania Associates Investment Fund started and they started buying up manufacturing businesses in Maine. So they left leaders, the M&A practice, ran the private equity funds, bought main based manufacturing companies and ran that for about 10 years. The fund is still running. They still own several yep. main manufacturers. And then my dad stepped away in probably 2015, 2016 from the private equity fund, semi-retired and decided to kind of do M&A advisory work under his own town associates. And mm -hmm. so he was just doing one or two deals a year focused on manufacturing, and that's what he'd been doing. Over that same period of time, I've been in the oil and gas industry in the energy segment uh, since I got out of the military for the last 15 yep. years. And then he and I kind of converged in 2020. I went out as an independent contractor doing my own thing. He was doing some M&A deals in the energy space, and he said, hey, yeah. if, if you're interested, you could join me. We could do some of these deals together. We did four or five deals over the course of a couple of years. And I was like, I really like this work. Mm -hmm. Discovered that I can work well with my dad, which is always a test, right? You know, mm -hmm. you never know until you do it. And then, and then I, I kind of had a lot of plates spinning all at once. Mm -hmm. I was doing energy consulting, energy development, M&A. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to go all in on something, I'd rather go all in on the family name and decided to I approached my dad. I said, hey, let's, we're doing this as a 1099 relationship. I said, why don't I come in as a, a partner and, and let's grow this business. And that's what we started this year and it's going well. And I think we've got some you know, exciting times ahead. So, so it's, it's 30 years of M&A practice between my dad and his, his colleagues. I'm fairly new to the M&A game, but I kind of bring over my military energy business experience and, and it's going really well so far. What's that energy experience that you're talking about? Yeah. So after I got out of the military, I just fell backwards into an upstream oil and gas company. So a small company that was drilling oil wells in Montana had gas fields in Australia, and yep. they were trying to do energy development, like these big global energy development projects, multi-billion dollar capital projects. And the CEO hired me right out of the military. I was a West Point guy. He said, I think you could probably figure this out. And he taught me everything for four years that I needed to know about the energy segment and uh, fell in love with it. And then mm -hmm. I kind of doubled down on um, my MBA from the University of Oklahoma with a specialty in energy. Yep. And I've just kind of navigated, I, I've kind of fallen more into the natural gas side of things yep. um, over the last 15 years. And specifically in New England on LNG, which is its own kind of niche industry up here. What is that? Liquefied natural gas. Okay. So almost all of the utilities, the gas utilities in New England use LNG as a storage fuel that they, mm -hmm. they use in the wintertime. 
So I've been working with utilities, developers, contractors to build that kind of infrastructure and still doing some of that work on the side. Yeah. But in doing that, I've worked with propane companies, oil companies, solar and wind companies. You know, you just, the energy industry always kind of converges. And um, so I've got a good broad, I'm not deep on anything, but yeah. I've got a good broad understanding of how the energy systems work. Yeah. And so when I when I apply that to M and A, um, I I can kind of understand their specific industries and some of their challenges, and it's been, mm -hmm. been successful so far. Do you see a lot of consolidation in those industries? You obviously do because you're involved in M and As, but like, is is that a lot of that happening right now? Yeah. So the re the reason I joined my dad in 2019 was he had done a deal through a friend of a friend, like an accountant, who had an, a propane company that he wanted to sell. He wanted to exit. My dad being the M&A expert, took it on, didn't know that much about the propane industry, um, but was able to successfully sell the business and realized at that time that the propane industry was going through massive consolidation. So it's really relevant to the state of Maine. So the state of Maine, still 60 to 70 percent of Mainers heat their homes with either heating oil or propane. So it's a big mm -hmm. industry here in the state. And it's getting hard for the smaller operators to keep up. You know, either it's folks getting to retirement age, they can't find the labor for technicians and drivers to keep up with the big companies, and then regulatory pressure, just all of the policy measures that are coming out against heating oil and propane. Mm -hmm. So, and it's already fragmented. So these, these companies are small, usually family operated, regional. So it's very fragmented and you got these big buyers, these big national companies that are coming in and, and um, scooping them up. So it's uh, very active in the heating oil and propane space. I bet. And there seems like there's just a bunch of small heating and propane companies in every single community. And one comes to mind, I, I did business with a company called Champagne's Energy. Are you familiar yep. with them yep. at all? Yep. And, you know, then they sold to some company called Superior. That's right. Whoever, you know, and just... So there was consolidation with them, and I'm sure it's going to happen more and more and more as people age out of out of being in the business, and then the kids don't want it, and there's no one that they've trained, like you said. It's just a it's an interesting thing. Yeah, Champagne's was actually a big deal because it was Superior was actually a Canadian company. It was, it was yeah. their first entry into the state of Maine. They got Down East, Champagne, and several others, and so what you see is these big national companies moving into the state through these regional acquisitions, and it's good because it sets up some diversity and some competition. But it's also really challenging because a lot of a lot of homeowners like dealing with the small family run businesses, local guys. You see them at the grocery store yeah. and we're seeing less and less of that over time. But I'm still amazed every time I think I know who all of the propane and heating oil suppliers are. I find a new one. You know, there's just so many of them out there. They're, they're tucked away in different pockets of the state. That's really interesting. So but it's primarily that type of energy company or company that you're trying to do business with. Um, you mentioned solar and wind. Like, how much has that crept into things over the years? Yeah. So right now, when I joined Towns Associates, um, my focus is on the energy side: heating oil, propane, and then HVAC. Mm -hmm. Those are the three large, fragmented, several operators and several, you know, large national buyers. So we're seeing a lot of activity there. And then what's happening is that it's kind of splintering off into some ancillary markets. So. At the end of the day, like solar installation and solar services, it's it's a lot of it is electrical contracting. So yeah. you're seeing electrical contractors growing, and then once they get to a size, they start to attract interest of large national buyers. So it's really an ecosystem: plumbers, electricians, service technicians, and then suppliers. It's a, a lot of the same labor force and you know technical trades. So mm -hmm. the other thing that we're seeing is folks that are trying to integrate. Right. So they start off as a propane company, then they add HVAC services. So they can come in and, you know, service your furnace. Yep. Um, then they can install heat pumps and maybe eventually, you know, manage or install solar installation. So it's really like everybody that's touching the home services business is mm -hmm. going through this consolidation uh, process. Mm -hmm. oh, that's really interesting to hear. As far as the M&A world, is there a lot of competition for you in that in that industry in Maine, or are you guys one of the only shows in town? No, there is, and I think it breaks down into either generalists or specialists. So mm -hmm. what we run up against is there are definitely incumbent specialists within the oil and propane world. They've been doing mm -hmm. this for thirty years, and we run up against them all the time. 
my dad, my dad kind of runs a manufacturing vertical and he mm-hmm. runs up against specialists in manufacturing as well. And then there's generalists. So folks that, you know, they just are the M and A experts and they can kind of sell any type of business. We fall in the generalist and specialist category. We like to have a niche, something that we have some, you know, historical experience with, mm-hmm. but in the state of Maine, if it's, you know, a general practice company, you know, pulp and paper, you know, construction, you know, all kinds of different services, we'll take a look at it. But yeah, there, there are a lot of M&A advisors. And, you know, our opinion is that it really comes down to it's a relationship driven business. So selling your company is one of the biggest decisions you're going to make. Um, mm-hmm. And for a lot of these folks, it's extremely personal, because they've been running this company six to seven days a week for 30 years, and it's all that they know. And the transition to retirement is a, is a significant transition for them. So having a trusted advisor that they can bring in to uh, help them through that process, get the most value, yeah. do it in an efficient way, really relies on, on a, you know, someone that you have a relationship with and that you can trust. So we like being a small shop. It's my dad and I, we're hands-on. We, you know, do all of the deals ourselves. And we think that, you know, is a differentiator when we're going up against a lot of larger M&A firms. Imagine these deals don't come together quickly. Yeah. Right. Like it's, <laughs> I, mean, I imagine, it's, you know, like you said, someone that's six days, seven days a week, 30 years, they're not just going to be like, okay. I mean, maybe sometimes that happens, but I imagine it's like, there's a lot of work that goes into this and it's a handful of deals a year. So, right? It's not like you're yeah. closing a sale of a deal every week, or maybe you are, but it just would make me think that the cycle is pretty long for those. It It is. It's very long. I mean, I think, you know, we're usually pretty happy if we each do three or four deals a year, you know, five yeah. to eight total. That's more than enough to keep us busy and allow us to have enough time to focus on each transaction specifically. But yeah, the sales cycle can be, you know, multiple years. You know, we we had one company reached out and said, hey, I'm thinking about selling. You know, what should I consider? So we talk them through, we get to know them, give them some, some tips and some pointers. They called back a year later and said, all right, I'm getting closer. You know, how, how does the market look? Are there still buyers? You know, am I in a good position? At that point, we did a valuation, said, hey, why don't we, why don't we sit down and, and discuss how much we think your business is worth? And then once they have a number in their mind, if they can kind of start to chew on a little bit more effectively and say, yeah. okay, I, I could actually retire on that number if, if we can make this work. And then another year went by and they called us back and said, all right, if that number is still a good number, if, if my company is still worth that, then I think I'm ready to go. So it was two years just before they even decided to sell. Yeah. And then a typical sales uh, process is you know six to nine months from bringing them out to the market, finding the right buyers, negotiating a letter of intent, and then getting through due diligence and closing. So it does take a long time. And you know we're very low pressure. You know it's you can't ever force anybody to sell. It's a decision they have to make yeah. on their own. And we just want to be. Involved as early as possible because there's things we can do early on to help put them in the best position once they decided to make that decision. What does that mean? Like just the way that their numbers look on the books, things like that, right? Because I mean, value is really driven based on some multiple of revenue or something or profit or right. Like if you plan for that stuff, probably can make it look more appealing to a buyer. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we like to start with evaluation. Is just let's look at your books, see how well you're keeping track of your margin. You know what's changing over time. Are you you have good handle on your expenses? You know if you have steady sales growth, disciplined gross profit margin, and a good handle on your expenses. You know that's a good place to start. If you don't, you know if your books are kind of a mess and each year you know you're up and down on on maintenance and and other overhead costs. Those are things that you could you could improve over mm-hmm. the next couple of years before you get ready to go. So some of it is just an economic decision, you know, and it is a multiple of EBITDA is typically the easiest way to look at things. Yep. But then there's the, the, the other, you know, intangibles, like how's your workforce? Do you have a general manager that could step in if you left tomorrow? Somebody that a new buyer could rely on to, to run the business, which for this size business, and we're in the five to $20 million transaction, lower, lower middle market. For that size company, a buyer likes it when you've got a qualified staff that can run and they don't have to bring in their own people and change everything on day one. So there's a lot that you can do in preparation for that sale to make sure that you're in the best possible position. I would think that sometimes the person that's selling the company would be 
it would be negotiated for that person to stay on staff for a period of time as well, or you typically don't see that? It, it goes both ways. In the oil and propane side, we see a pretty quick transition, like okay. three months. For manufacturing and some of the bigger companies that we tr- we deal with, we actually see employment agreements where the owner will stay on for two to three years. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it definitely depends on the, the market segment. And there's pluses and minuses to both. Sometimes a, a, an owner that's halfway out the door with his mind on retirement isn't the person you want running the business for the next 12 months, mm-hmm. right? So a successful transition can be a nice three-month handoff, make sure the employees and the customers are, are happy. The new buyer knows the processes and everything, where everything is. And then they can kind of ride off into the sunset, retire, and the new owner can start to put their, you know, stamp on things. That I bet. Yeah. Now, when you say you bring a company to market to be sold, what does that look like? In my world, I do mortgage stuff, which we talked about, and houses get listed on the MLS, and there's this marketplace to go find these homes and Zillow and all that stuff. Are there websites that you use? Is there is it more word of mouth? How does that part work? Yeah, there there are a lot of really good websites that that we can use from time to time, but the way we position ourselves is it's almost always relationship driven. And this, the other reason we do like to be specialists within a vertical. So on the oil and propane side, I, I think I have a good handle on who all of the buyers are. And so mm-hmm. we typically tell a, a, a seller, you know, we're not going to publicly list you. We're not just putting you out on a, a generic website. We're going to go directly to the decision makers of the buyers, the CEOs or the VP of corporate development. And we're going to present your company directly to those buyers. So one thing is you're not getting spammed with a lot of unqualified mm-hmm. offers, right? And the other thing is, is once we've packaged the company and brought it to these buyers, they know that it's, it's real, that the seller mm-hmm. has made the decision to exit, that the information has been packaged properly. All the typical questions are answered up front. So, and, and it's done on a confidential basis, right? So we, we want to try and keep it quiet so there's no disruption to the marketplace, right? Yeah. And, and then the other thing is we want to get almost like an auction process, right? So we contact 20 or 30 buyers. We give them a deadline, you know, here's the company and all of the information you need to make a decision. We want to see offers in four to six weeks or whatever the time frame we decide is. So that creates some competition and some urgency where the buyers mm-hmm. all decide, hey, if this is a company I want to acquire, I need to put in, you know, my best offer. Yep. And that's why we, you know, we do recommend sellers work with advisors like us. You know, for the for a propane company in Northern Maine, you can call your competitor and say, hey, I'm ready to t- retire, buy me out. And, and, mm-hmm. and they probably give you a number. But if you get 15 companies and maybe some from New Hampshire or out of state, bigger companies involved, then you get this competitive process that uh, almost always works out better for the seller. Yeah. That's an interesting way that it's done. I guess I didn't really think of it the way that you did it. I just kind of assumed that it gets listed someplace and people make offers that aren't necessarily qualified. But yeah, I'm sure as as someone that owns that type of company, they want to make sure that it's going to be in good hands, which means it's really going to be a competitor for someone that's already in the business. It's not like you're going to find someone that's retiring from their high paying finance job that just has a bunch of money to spend and that, you know, just wants to dabble in energy. Like, like, yeah. You know. It's kind of the nature of the, the businesses that we work with. Every once in a while, we will get a, a company that might be a good fit for private equity or other like strategic or search fund type buyers where people are specifically looking for a set of characteristics. And we'll put mm-hmm. that out onto a database. We use Axial. It's qualified buyers. We put all the financials into the database and you can find somebody in Chicago or Arizona, you know, kind of randomly, but it yeah. has to be a, a specific type of company that fits that profile. Mm-hmm. But if it's companies that we've been working with for a long time, the best buyers are typically the ones that are already in the industry. Do you have any mem- memorable success stories that you talk about? Or, I mean, everything's probably pretty private, but is there something that comes to mind, like a good situation that worked out for buyers and sellers? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I like about the oil and propane business here in Maine is the, the quality of people. I mean, Mainers are hard workers to begin with, very typically family oriented, but these guys, guys and girls that have been running these companies, I mean, they're, they're literally, you know, in the truck, pulling a hose on Christmas Eve when it's zero degrees out in the (laughs) snowstorm, right? And this is the type of people that, that are doing these things. And they've put almost all of their free time and their resources into this business. So when it comes time to retire and make that transition, it's just really enjoyable to 
watch them go through the emotional transition to this is my baby. I'm now going to hand this off to somebody else, but mm-hmm. I'm going to get compensated for all of this hard work. We just, we had two, and I like to follow up with the seller like a year later and just say, how's it going? Like, well, how's retirement mm-hmm. life treating you? Or what are you doing? Maybe you're not retired. We had one up in Belfast and extremely hardworking guy, uh, five kids, kids decided they didn't want to take over the business. And he was young. He was in his mid fifties. And, mm-hmm. and the family all said, you know what? I, I think, I think you need to retire. You work in 80 hours a week and we'd love to see more of you. And so he sold the business. It went really well. And I followed up with him and he's, he, he and his wife did a, a road trip around the country, went to all 50 states, well, 48 contiguous states yeah. Yeah. and is dabbling in some consulting work, but is just really enjoying not having the stress of running 80 hours a week. Right. And so those are the stories. Another company we sold, she's now a state legislator, you know, serving the, the state, you know, as mm-hmm. a congresswoman. And, you know, so there is life after the transition for a lot of folks, but you can kind of see the stress of running a small business I've... be lifted. And those are the things that we love to see, you know, and we, we really, we develop a relationship with these sellers over a course of nine months. And there's a lot of tears. There's a lot of mm-hmm. anxiousness. And, you know, I've learned a lot from my dad. He's just really good at managing everybody's emotions at the negotiations table when mm-hmm. things are getting intense and making sure we've got a good financial decision uh, being made, but also re- respecting how emotional this can be yeah. uh, for a seller. So that's been really rewarding. I mean, I come out of oil and gas in Houston and it's very cutthroat, go, go, Is go. It- you know, it's like, my time in the military and uh and that's great and it works but being in a small family business environment in the state of maine has been really rewarding i bet um let's talk about the military history for a second i don't know that i know anyone personally that went to west point what did that whole part of your life look like leading up to there is that something you always knew you wanted to do or how'd you end up there yeah it was very random chance i went to High school in Portland. I was a junior or maybe even a end of sophomore year. Anyways, my guidance counselor walked into my history class and said, Hey, there's a cadet from West Point here. And I think you're, you might be a good candidate. You should talk to him. Mm-hmm. And I literally turned to my buddy and I said, What's West Point? And he, <laughs> he said, I think it's a military academy. I was like, All right, I'll go hear him out. I heard him out, sounded interesting, told my parents. My mom was like, Absolutely not. My dad's like, This is a cool idea. Yeah. And then it, the, the process just started to go. I, 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 the more I looked into it, the more I realized it was a very prestigious academy, very rigorous and hard to get into. Yeah. And just something about the rigor and challenge of it was, was interesting. Didn't come from a military background. My grandfather was in World War II and loved his stories. But yep. like most people's grandparents were involved in the war. I didn't have a personal connection to it. So I just knew it was a, a challenge and exciting and got accepted. And that was kind of the hardest part. Once I made up my mind, I, you know, went after it and, and, and then hated all four years being there. <laughs> but, I mean, it doesn't sound like an easy situation. How, no, how was, rigorous is it to get in? It, it, and we said it's like very selective. Like it, that is what I, I would think I would not even have a chance to get into a school like West Point, and maybe most people don't, but did, were you very smart in school? Was there something about, you know, like what was the thing that got you? Yeah. I think what it was is, I mean, they're what it's a leadership Academy and mm-hmm. they're looking for folks that are prone to leadership. And, and mm-hmm. I had fortunately demonstrated that in my high school career, my grades were sufficient to get in, mm-hmm. to get accepted, but really what they're looking for is, you know, captain of the football team, student body mm-hmm. president involved in extracurriculars, you know, well-rounded and balanced. So I had all of those things, which I was fortunate. I didn't really know anything but working hard. I think of my mm-hmm. daughter who's about to graduate high school and she's, I didn't tell her to do any things, but she's the captain of multiple sports teams, yeah. class, class president, honor society, all these things. Yeah. And those are the kind of kids that they're looking for. And, and then, I mean, it is, it's hard, it's hard to, the hardest thing is to graduate, is to make yeah. it through four years. But once you get selected and once they say, yeah, we, we think you're the right candidate, then it's, you know, it's mind over matter for the next four years. Is there a lot of uh, dwindling down of numbers over the course of the four years or? Yeah. Like what's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's like uh 20 to 30%, you know, so 70% graduate from day yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. The first year is the biggest attrition. And the way it works is you get two free years. You can go to school there for two years 
And then before your junior year, you have to make a commitment. And at that point, if you drop out or get kicked out after your junior or senior year, you have to kind of pay, pay things back. So most of the attrition's in the first two years. And then after that point, you've kind of figured out the system. And as long as your grades are good, you can, you can get through graduation. Get through. But are you committing to some level of service for five years afterwards or 10 years? Yeah. Like what, what's that look yeah. like? Yeah. Once you graduate, it's a five-year commitment. Um, uh-huh. I don't think that's changed. And uh, I did six. Now it's just because my last year was a deployment. So it was yeah. like, hey, you're, you're going to be gone for 12 months. So we extended you from five to six. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, typically five years. I, I never had the intention of doing like a full 20 year uh, career in the military. Yep. The idea was get the degree, do five years of uh, service as an army officer, which I was really happy to do, and then move the family back to Maine. That was always the, the plan, you know. And then I did two deployments and realized that's exactly the right plan. <laughs> it was, it was, I can uh, imagine. Were, were you in Iraq or Afghanistan? Yeah, I did Iraq twice. Yeah. I did Bag- Baghdad 2006 and 2008. And, you know, just the, the rigors of that on a family. I had my first daughter in the middle of my first deployment and my second daughter before my second deployment mm-hmm. and then my third son right when we got back. So it was, you know, even though I really wasn't interested in staying 20 years at that point, it was like, it, yeah, you're just not going to see me for the next 10, you know, and yeah. uh, that wasn't that wasn't right for the family. Sounds like an easy, an easy decision to make. Yeah, it was at the time. Do you feel like your business career and your life has benefited from that experience at West Point in the military? Yeah, it certainly has. And I mean, I tell everybody to give a hard look at the military, especially for 18 year olds that don't know exactly what they want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it just pro- provides so much opportunity, structure, discipline. And, and, and fortunately, you know, America still really values its veterans. And that's, that's a positive thing to be able to have that experience. But I got out of the military February of 2009. So the economy Mm -hmm. had just collapsed. Housing market was upside down. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to get into commercial real estate. And I met with a high school friend of mine who was just Lamontane, a Mm -hmm. successful commercial broker. And I remember him saying, just like, don't do this. Don't come in. You're you're (laughs) going to hate it. Like, this is not the right time. And so I I said, all right, I'm going to think about something else and ended up getting into energy. But the point was that I ended up getting several job offers in a down economy when nobody was hiring because employers are still willing to say, you know what, this military exp- experience is so valuable. We'll, we'll, we'll take, we'll find a spot for this guy. Yeah. And I've experienced the benefits of that over the last 15 years is it does open doors. People understand there's kind of a baseline constitution of somebody that's mm-hmm. gone through that type of rigor at that mm-hmm. age. And, and so, yeah, I, 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 I look back on it with a lot of fondness and, and thankfulness that I was able to do that. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I appreciate the service, man. So it's, it's quite a story. And I definitely would think of people that go to West Point, hold them to a certain level. And and one, thing, um, one of my my classmate and roommates at West Point, he actually was at Pratt & Whitney in Maine in the Berwick plant. He, they just moved him to Michigan, but he's mm-hmm. been with Pratt & Whitney for a long time. And I remember him telling me, he, he was like a super stud. I was just mm-hmm. average. He was mm-hmm. one of those guys at West Point that you be like, yeah. this is a West Point. And he, I remember him telling me, he's like, you know, what? I'll do things at this big Fortune 500 company without even thinking about, you know, why I would do that. And people mm-hmm. will come up to me and it's like, how did you think to do that? And he's just realized that all of the 10 years that he spent in West Point in the military has ingrained so much leadership skills that we do things without even thinking about it, you know, that other people that just haven't had that experience, you know, don't have the opportunity to, to learn over time. So it really does, you know, even, you know, you, you can find great leaders anywhere, you know, yeah. but you just, you get a lot of reps at a young age, to put those skills to work. And, and that's been very beneficial. I'm glad you mentioned that you think people should give military service a thought, you know, because there are a lot of kids that don't know what the heck they're going to do when they graduate high school. And it's, yeah. a, it's a great opportunity. You know, you hear about enrollments being down across all branches of the military. I don't know how true that is, but, you know, I think it's a, it's a great spot for a lot of people to start and hopefully people look, look it over. Yeah, I, I, I think so. One of my cousins decided to do it, just did three years. And, you know, it was just a great opportunity for him to mature and grow, came back. Now he's doing great here in Southern Maine. You know, it's just a once in a lifetime opportunity. And there's really not a lot of downside if, if you really go in with the intention of growing and maturing and taking as much of the experience as you can. And 18 is just so young. You know what I mean? It's like you don't have to have it all figured out. And the military can kind of help you with that. 
I would say military <laughs> or trades. I mean, we need yeah. we need people in the service and, and we need people in the trades for sure. It's insane to think people are going to decide what they want to do as 18 year old. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, kids. My, right. my daughter's a little younger than yours, but my twelve year old daughter. I'm like, what do you? Yeah. You know, sometimes we'll talk. Like, what do you think you want to do? And she has no clue. And it's like, how could she possibly? I mean, there's certain people that their dad was a doctor and grandparents were a doctor, and like they're going to be doctors or dentists yeah. or whatever. But most people, it's not that way. So what it's really interesting figuring it out. So yeah, you know, it's I mean, same here. So it's worth reminding people to to take a look at that. So yeah. getting back to some of the business stuff as we're wrapping up. What advice would you have for entrepreneurs that are looking to sell their business? What's like the number one thing you tell people? Yeah, I got this from my dad. He always says, you should start thinking about selling your business the day you start it. And that's really hard for a lot of folks. Starting a business is extremely difficult and you're just happy to see it grow to make, to earn a living. Um, and you're not really thinking about the exit, but the folks that do incorporate exit strategies or succession planning early, not only one, does it help you grow the fundamentals of your business to make it a, a more profitable business, um, but two, sometimes life events happen outside of your control, right? So whether it's health issues or just changes in your family dynamics, and then you realize, oh, I have to sell now. And mm -hmm. if you weren't planning for it and you weren't thinking ahead, then it catches you by surprise. So, you know, I think as you start the business, you know, having a, a plan, you know, I, I want to grow this to, to 10 million or I want to get to this size in employee count. And, and that might be an opportunity for me to exit or to take on new investment or partnerships is it really helps develop the discipline early mm -hmm. on to, you know, form a, a, a really professional organization. And that's hard for a young entre entrepreneur to do because you're just you're wearing so many hats, you're trying to figure it out. But again, that's why there's advisors out there that can help you with that. They can help yep. you with exit planning, succession planning. And sometimes it's just a conversation. You know, just yep. we look at your books, we say, hey, you're, you're, you're doing great. If you keep this growth up and, and uh, you tighten up a little bit here on operating expense, or you need to pay attention to gross profit margin a little bit closer, call me in three years. You, we can see a lot of growth when they start putting that kind of attention on it. Mm -hmm. Good thought. What's the best referral for you right now? Is it a certain company? Is it accountants? Is it what's like the best thing that you're looking for to be connected to in your business? Yeah, because we want to be a trusted advisor and want to develop a relationship. Most of our business comes in through referrals from people that are already working with the, with the seller, right? So that's mm -hmm. their lawyer, their accountant, or somebody that they're already doing business with. So I'll give you an example. In the propane world, I work with a lot of wholesalers folks that are selling the supply into the into the small operator so they know where everybody is in in their you know progression they know who's getting tired who's ready to kind of check out who's still growing and these people within that industry you know you you, you, you everybody likes to talk you know you'll be talking to one of your vendors or suppliers or your accountants like man i'm getting tired you know i'm i'm, I'm not sure i can do this for another 3 winters Mm -hmm. And that's usually when they'll say, hey, you should call Jeff and Jeff, you know, just, just hear them out, see what they have to say. And that's where most of our referrals are coming into, co coming in from. And we do our typical, typical marketing and want to be present and top of mind for people within our specific industries. Um, but like cold outreach, you know, if you're not a seller, if you're running and growing your business and you're not even thinking about selling right now, like we're not on your radar at all. Yeah. Right? It's not until you've kind of had that moment that aha, like, I don't know if I can do this for another three or five years. And you start asking around to the folks that you do trust. If they're aware of us, then, you know, it usually connects the dots and, and mm -hmm. starts a pretty good conversation. Love it. What's the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, I, I try to stay pretty active on LinkedIn. And again, there's two of us. My dad's Jeff Towns. I'm Jeff Towns. So make sure you're reaching out to JT Towns. Mm -hmm. So you can find me on LinkedIn or our website, townassociates.com. And definitely like to, you know, do more of these podcasts and, and just get, you know, there's so many ways to, to reach out and, and touch people and explain to them what's going on. So, you know, we try to stay busy in that regard. Love it, man. Well, listen, I appreciate you coming on. Look forward to sharing all this information out to everyone that listens. And then uh, hopefully you make some connections from there. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, appreciate you coming on. We'll be in touch. Thanks.